Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word today, Finding the Fountain of Life. Two powerful and encouraging psalms. We're looking at Psalms 35 and 36. Verse 9 of chapter 36, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Psalm 35 is considered David's appeal to God for deliverance from Saul as Saul was pursuing David in the wilderness of En Gedi over in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now, Psalm 35 is one of the impeccatory psalms calling for God to come against the wicked that was pursuing David. Now, the occasion for the writing of Psalm 36 is uncertain. It was most likely during either Saul's pursuit of David or during Absalom's uh, rebellion. Verse 1 of chapter 35, Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive against me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Basically saying, be my advocate, Lord. Now this is uh, the connection that scholars see to 1 Samuel chapter 24 when David was unjustly being pursued by Saul. Let me read that, verse 15 of chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. Therefore let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So he's calling upon the Lord to be his advocate. But additionally, God is seen as a warrior and David is calling upon him to battle his enemies. Jeremiah described God in a very similar way in Jeremiah chapter 20. The Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. Now, we've covered this before, but here it is again. So I need to address it. The Lord is a warrior. Now, again, many are offended by this uh, militaristic terminology, but it is in the Bible. And we should be asking ourselves, what is the Lord trying to communicate to us through his word? Well, here's what I see this as meaning. It, it's communicating to us that we're in a battle. Now, it's not a physical battle, but it's a spiritual one. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to de destroy strongholds. Now, I received a message recently from someone asking, where in the Bible does it, that phrase that you use appear, where the Old, and this is the phrase, where the Old Testament speaks to the physical, whereas the New Testament speaks to the spiritual? Well, that phrase is not in the Bible, but the principle clearly comes from script, Scripture, as I just pointed out. Jesus, our model, battled Satan. Remember, first he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and then he battled him on the cross. He defeated sin and death and Satan. <clears throat> it was a spiritual battle. Again, look at the words of the Apostle Paul that we see over in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. In this imprecatory psalm, David uses one of those spiritual weapons, prayer. He's praying. And then he moves to, you know, not only be my advocate, but be their adversary. Look at verse 4. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like the chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without calls they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without calls for my life. Let destruction come upon them unexpectedly, and let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. Pretty straightforward. David is asking God to turn the tables on his enemies and make the pursuers the pursued by the Lord. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. There, now there's debate over whether or not in this age of grace that we should be praying in peccatory prayers. Now, I can only give you my opinion, and this is, this is my opinion. You're free to disagree. I believe they're here, preserved in Scripture for a reason. And there have been many times that I've prayed that God would cause the schemes of those who oppose Him and his people be turned on them. Now with this outcome 
and uh, they would be prompted to understand that Jesus Christ is Lord and their eyes would be opened to the truth and they would be drawn to him in their need. Still for a redemptive purpose, that they would not succeed in their schemes against God and his purposes, but they would be frustrated and as a result they would turn to God and be saved. Look again at what he says in verse 4, because I think this is important. Verse 4, chapter 35. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Now, look at verse 26. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed and shamed and, uh, with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Now, I'll be very candid. I prayed for confusion to envelop those who are opposing the truth of God. In fact, I'm praying that right now. I'm recording this in advance uh, of leaving to go to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin for the Republican Platform Committee, which I serve on. And I am working to ensure that at least one party continues to protect unborn children being in alignment with or in closer alignment with the Word of God. And there are those in the party that are opposing this, that want to move away from protecting a life, the unborn, because they see it as a political losing issue. Well, I'm praying that those that are pushing this, that confusion would descend upon their ranks. And I would ask you to join me in praying that. All right, down to verse 24. Vindicate me, O Lord my God according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Notice here, David's appeal is not to his own righteousness. We, we can't do that. There, are, there is no righteousness in and of ourselves. We are all uh, sinners in need of a Savior. But as we are clothed in Christ, and um, we appeal based upon that, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25, let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Rather than evil men, men be glad because of their evil schemes, David prays, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Again, this psalm, it uh, follows a pattern of an appeal to God followed by a promise of praise. And we must never fail to praise God for who he is and the good things that he has done. Now let's look at uh, Psalm 36, and I'm going to use, uh, for this uh, psalm, I'm going to use the ESV translation. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. Now David immediately puts his finger on the heart of wickedness. What is it? Look at it right here. There is no fear of God. Because the ungodly believes they are beyond the reach of God and his judgment. So there's no fear of God. The, the, and that, that, by the way, is what gives rise to lawlessness. That's one of the reasons we see the lawlessness in our culture today is because there's no fear of God. We, we, we've, we've kicked God out of uh, the public square, out of our schools, out of our public uh, discourse. And so there's no fear of him anymore. We've taught our children not to fear him as opposed to fearing him. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. This is the wicked man. Now the first four verses describe the wicked, which is then contrasted with those who put their trust in God, who know him and his righteousness. Look at verse 5. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the rivers, from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Now look at the benefits, right, right here that flow from those who put, uh, flow to those who put their trust in God. Number one, unending mercy. Unending mercy. Number two, the, the preserving wisdom of God's righteousness and His judgments. See, we gain wisdom from the Word of God. Number three, abundant life, drinking from the river of God's pleasure. Number four, in God we discover this fountain of life. And uh, number five, through the light of God we see the light of life. Now, this is the water, I believe, that Jesus offered to the Samaritan woman over in the New Testament in John chapter 4. Remember that account? Uh, in verse uh, 13, Jesus answered and said to, her, said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Talking about the water that was in the well. But, he says in verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain, a fountain of water springing up into ever lasting life. You see, the fountain of life is found in Jesus. Trust Him and discover that fountain today. Father, thank You for Your Word. And Lord, You are the fountain of life. And I pray that we would drink from it. And Lord, we can freely just by trusting in You. And so I pray for those that are a part of this journey, maybe those who have just joined for the first time. Somehow they came across this message. Lord, I pray that if they do not know you, they've never taken from the fountain of life by trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, confessing Jesus as the Lord of their life. I pray that they would do that, receive the forgiveness, and walk then in the, in the life, the abundant life that Jesus has made available for us. We thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would continue to use it showing us how to apply it to our lives and this world in which we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. Keep praying. And uh, until next time, keep standing on the Word.